You're watching the Greg Davis show. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will, I shall rejoice and be glad in it. And I get to say my online sin now prosperity. You're probably wondering where is the bishop at today? Well, he's here, but he's sitting adjacent. He's in the opposite seat. He is a guest today on his own show. Before we get into that, I want to tell you, just remind you to just continue to watch us every day. Watch the Greg Davis show every day, live at five. But then you can also hear us in the morning at nine from 8 to 9 a.m. on WEHA 88.7. That's our market in Atlantic City, Radio 1000, Cleveland, Ohio, and 860 a.m. every single day at 8 a.m. in the morning. So today's show, many of you have always wondered exactly how did Bishop lose all of this weight? You've been able to see his transition for the past 10 years that he's been on television and you've seen him go from one man to the man that he is today. And today we're going to focus on actually, how did he do it? Did he have surgery? How was the surgery? Was it painful? I don't know. We're going to, we're going to talk about that. So I would like to welcome to the show, the man of God himself. <laughs> Mr. Gregory Michael Davis. Welcome. Really? You're going to put it out there yeah. like that? Yeah. I'm putting when it they out already there. said I had surgery? Yeah, I'm going to put oh, it out they're there. on the phone yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. but we're we going to set the record straight today. We, it's I, good to be here, Lola. It's, it's, I'm so glad. Tell Greg I said hello. I'll let him know. <laughs> I'll let him know. Young man, you have had a tremendous journey in life. And Essentially, at least for sure, for the last 10 years, people have been able to watch your life unfold before their very eyes on TV. Uh, some know you personally, some know you from what they read in the papers, read on the blogs and see on TV. But today, I would like to uncover just a little bit more about who is Gregory Michael Davis. And we're going to talk about health, some of the health challenges and things of that nature. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I was I was born in Los Angeles, California. Most people don't know that. Uh, raised in New York until I was nine by my mother, who um, many have heard me tell the testimony, who was a prostitute. My mom was a call girl. She uh, had a common law husband by the name of Sam Moore, which those that may be older will remember Sam and Dave. Hold on, I'm coming, I'm a soul man, which the Blues Brothers were depicted from. Um, and my dad was a rock and roll R&B guitar player, Billy Guitar Davis is what they called him. Let me say he, this. He's, a, he's, a, he's inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame. The rock, rock and roll, roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. And so I come from an, an entertainment family. My, my mother dated, I won't name the, the artists that she dated, um, one who was very physical with her. Uh, if I named the name, they'd be like, she had a scar on my eye, and she would always say, uh, I'll say the initials, JB did this. And so my mother was, was Caucasian, so she was a beautiful woman, um, but she had a thing for, for R&B singers, for, for entertainers. And um, I grew up around cocaine. I watched my stepfather shoot heroin in his arm. And so my dad came one day and said, you know, I think we need to kind of you know, think about moving him to, to, to my parents. Got to Detroit reluctantly. And uh, my grandparents was Reverend Ananias Davis, First Lady Jenny Davis, pastor of the Welcome Baptist Church, First Lady. Changed my life at nine years old. I received Jesus Christ at nine and a half years old. And as, as they say, I've been running ever since. Uh, over, over 40 years, I've been in, in church, 40, 42 years, I've been in church active from day one. I started off as a junior usher, a Sunday school superintendent, on and on and on and on. And um, so my mom died when I was 19. And um, so I never saw her again until I identified her because I was the only child. Um, she tried to get rid of me when I was um, in her belly. She had gotten rid of two children by pulling them out with a clothes hanger. 
And um, she told me, she said, you're too stubborn. I couldn't get rid of you. Well, we know now that means God really wanted me here. Yeah. And uh, I'm grateful to that. But I never saw my mother again until they called one of her, um, one of her former Johns, let, her live, let him live with her, uh, older man. And he called me just like this. You Gregory? I said, yeah, your mom's dead. You need to come identify her. And I went and identified my mom. And uh, Keith Dinkins, a friend of mine, mm -hmm. since high school, he, he rode the Greyhound bus with me to identify. I couldn't even afford to bury her then. So they buried her at the state of New York, uh, buried her. And um, that's, that's the last time I saw her. For many people, that would shift and destroy their lives. Mm -hmm. We know at the age of nine, you migrated from New York City to Detroit, Michigan. At nine years old, been taken from your mom, how did that affect you? Um, you know, I've even since a child, I've always not been one to just, um, just to, to think about things. I, I think it's something that's in me. I don't, I don't tarry in where, where I'm at. I'm always reaching towards something else. Um, I failed to say I didn't go to school most of my, my uh, life until I got to my grandparents. I had missed probably every grade, but I started it probably fourth grade. One of my mother's friends asked me to move to Cleveland and I went to the fourth grade, but most of the time truant officers were at the house. I graduated from school with a 3.8, um, even though I didn't go to school most of my life, but I still graduated. First one to graduate from high school out of my grandparents. Um, but I chose not to be victim I chose to keep aspiring. I was, again, my, my father quit school when he was in the 12th grade. My auntie, who I was raised with, she quit in the 12th grade. And I just wanted to be better. My grandfather always told a testimony. He never had to weigh up. I never use an alarm clock, even today. I am self-motivated. And it's just been something that's been in me all of my life, ever since I was a kid. My mom used to leave me alone at home and uh, my stepfather would be on the road and I knew how to keep myself entertained. I knew how to keep myself going. Never got into trouble, but um, I didn't allow myself to be victimized. I never thought about it because my grandparents were good people. They were already in their 60s. Uh, my grandfather was 60 and my grandmother was in her late 50s and I just chose not to be the victim. And when I got here to Detroit, my auntie didn't want me here, so she used to Say, I'm gonna have my cousin beat you up. What you do? You, you, she was jealous. She was the only child that was there at home. And so I had to deal with that. And finally, we became best of friends. I ended up preaching her eulogy at her funeral because uh, she preceded my grandfather even in death. Um, but it didn't bother me. You know, many, many people, we won't even just talk about children, but many people that have seen the level of adversity that you saw at a young age would be the excuse they use as to why they will not excel in school, why they're, I mean, everything in life becomes the excuse as to why they're not successful. But you took those same excuses, but turned them around and turned them into opportunities. As a child, a teenager, let's go to your teenage years, did you know what you wanted to do in the future? Did you have vision for your future? Um, actually, I was accepted into three, three colleges, um, uh, Howard, Morehouse, and Wayne State. Um, I chose to go to Wayne State uh, because it was local and I'm glad I did because I went two days and and I, I want everybody to hear this young people that's listening This is not for everybody. I went two days and decided that college wasn't for me um, As I look now I've, I've done well um, And I don't I don't you know my daughter heard me say that one day on the radio show She's like, well, what am I going to No, you need to do that but because they don't work for everybody right. um but as I, as I think back, Murray Wright, one of our high schools, was building a television studio. 
And I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get into television. I wanted to be behind the scenes. And so I took the bus for four years to Murray Wright, one of our premier high schools, brand new studio, learn how to work cameras, everything, and host. What I'm doing now is what I went to school for. I am living my dream. And so this, what, what I'm doing now is what I want to do. I ran from preaching because I saw, preachers understand, I saw what my grandfather went through. So I accepted my calling. It'd be 30 years next year uh, when I was 23, 24 years old. What do you say to the person that has dealt with adversity? but they use that adversity for it. This is going to sound mean, because, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Get asking. over it. Get over it. That simple. Get over it. Deal with it. If you need to go and talk to, to the person that caused the adversity, if you need to go sit at the graveyard, whatever you need to do to detox yourself and get it out of you, simply this way, get over it. It is toxic. It can get in your bloodstream and cause you not to move forward. Get simple. Get over it. Get over it. Stop being a victim. One of the things you mentioned, your friend Keith Dinkins, that was the young man that went to uh, New York with you to help identify your body. My, my, mother, your, my, your my mother's body. <laughs> yeah, your mother's body. Was it the people around you that helped push you forward as well, your circle of influence? I've always hung around people that were older than me. It was it was Deacon Johnson, Emmett Johnson. It was Deacon Thomas. It was Deacon Mosley. It was Mother Mosley. It was Mother Johnson. It was little old Mother White. These are real people mm -hmm. that I'm naming to you. Mm -hmm. It was Reverend D. Berry. Uh, Yes, those people and more. Sister Johnson, Deacon, Deacon Johnson's wife, uh, all of those people, they helped to form who I am. I see their faces right now. They would point them, and I think this is where we're losing it with our young people. It took a village to raise me. It, my grandfather, he also worked construction. He was busy, and so I would go to the church during the week when I didn't have to be there. I would go to the barbecue and car wash. I lived at the church and those people helped raise me. They formed my life. It was, it was Aunt Plaque. This is a real, this is my grandmother's sister. It, it was Aunt Sophie. It, it was all, of, it was Cousin Bernice. All of these people, Cousin Teddy, all these, these are real people that helped raise me. And I am because of they are, because they are, or they were. They speak to the circle of influence and how the circle of influ influence has the strongest impact on your life because when you look at the people that shaped and mold you and how they poured into your life, it's a direct reflection of where you are today. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that you understand that impact because had not those people been there, it's a possibility that your life could have gone in a different direction. Oh, so many, so many, so many different ways. But uh, as Helen Bella said, I had a praying grandmother. My grandmother was my ace. My grandfather said, I know you love me, but that's your ace. And when my grandmother passed, it was devastating in my life. Um, I think boys are close to the mothers. And I had a big flower made into an ace because I love my grandmother. There's not a day I don't think about my grandparents. They, they are the reason, they are the reason why I am today. They saved my life. Now my father got me to my grandparents. My father never bought me a bike. He never bought me this, never bought me that. But he did, he gave me life twice. He gave me life when him and my mother got together. They weren't married. Uh, and then he gave me life when he took me out of New York because he said if I did, if I stayed in New York, I was going to die in the streets. Now, I was going to be successful. I would have been successful as a, as a drug dealer or whatever because success is in my genes. But there was a greater calling on my life. And I had recently a lady that found me. Her name is Ponce from Atlanta. She found me, and uh, she was my mother's best friend. She sent a picture of me with her daughter. I said, where were we at? She said, you were always coming from my church. I said, I went to church? She said, yeah, I used to take you to church. I don't even remember it. So it's, it's been put in me even when I didn't know it. So I thank God for those people. When we come back, we're gonna go a little deeper. We're gonna talk about, were you a healthy child? Were you a plump child? Did you eat candy for breakfast? Did you have cupcakes for dinner? We're gonna talk about that because we wanna figure out where did the weight gain, weight gain begin? Stay tuned, stay locked, it's The Greg Davis Show. We'll be right back right after this. 
how I did it. Pick up this life-changing book today by Bishop Greg Davis. Bishop Davis shares his amazing story of dramatic weight loss, overcoming diabetes, and his new journey to healthy living without surgery, dieting, or medication. How I did it. An incredible weight loss story captured in less than 50 pages. It tells the bishop's testimony of his lifestyle change after being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in April 2010. In less than eight months, he lost over 80 pounds and was completely healed of diabetes. To date, he has lost over 110 pounds and feels phenomenal. How I Did It by Bishop Day. A personal testimony requested by people all over the country. He did it and so can you. Order your copy now. On Amazon.com. Or send a seed of $25, which includes shipping and handling to Greg Davis Ministry. P.O. Box 44072. Detroit, Michigan 48244. That's Greg Davis Ministry. P.O. Box 44072. Detroit, Michigan 48244. And you're watching The Greg Davis Show. And today we're talking about how he did it. How did he lose the weight? In the first half, we talked a little bit about his childhood growing up. And we heard him say that he was called to ministry or he accepted his call to ministry at the age of 23. And we're going to talk about that. But I want to know, you know, I've heard a lot about your childhood. But were you... Uh, were you a chunky little boy? I wasn't. Were you a skinny little boy? I was boy? very skinny. You were skinny? I was very skinny. I, I didn't know. I was very skinny. First of all, my mother couldn't cook. <laughs> uh, my mother cooked box macaroni and cheese Ooh. and stuff like we ate at the deli most of the time. New York life. Yeah. And so my mother didn't cook like that. Um, and so, no, I was, I was a very, I was very skinny. All right. Young man, yeah. So were you skinny through high school? And I was that? skinny all my life. All your life? All my life. I'm supposed to be skinny. You're supposed to be skinny. Yeah. So at what point did you begin to see the shift? Because there's a point in every man's life they have, you know, like you said, you're skinny all your life. And then there's that grown man weight that I call it. That's that good, that, you know, that good where they, it's like, yeah, he's a man now. Yeah. He, you know, they say women, you're filling out. But men, they fill out too. And they, you know, it's not that they're big, but they just turn into a man, they shift from a boy to a man. At what point did you begin to come into your man? When I when, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, I, I hear what you're saying. We become mature in our look and all mm -hmm. that. But I start gaining weight probably after I start pastoring. Okay. Um, and me and Pastor Kim married. So I would say. Full gospel started in 91, but I would say 93, mm -hmm. uh, probably when we moved to Louisiana. And, you know, because church food folk, all they do is what? Cook and eat. The first thing they ask what before we even start church, where we're going after church. Yes. And so I think that that's where I start picking up my weight from all of the fellowships, from all of the travel. For, I mean, that's all we did was go to church and eat. So I would say mid nineties, I started picking up weight. Mid nineties. I didn't even notice. I didn't even notice it though. How at your lowest? How much did you weigh? At my very lowest. Yeah. Uh, one. You you mean what like you when care? I was growing up? Yeah. Fifty. One. One fifty. One sixty. How tall are you? I'm five eight. Five eight. My 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 ideal weight is one seventy. That's your idea. That's, that's my ideal weight. Okay. And that's where I'm at. All right. So you were 150 yeah, through I was your teenage and mm -hmm. 20s. You began pastoring. Mm -hmm. Pastor, which, what would you like for dinner? Yeah. And what yeah, would you say? Yeah, those good cooks. Yeah, you know, girl. you tell them what you want. Yeah, Mother, Mother Hattie is cooking dinner yeah, tonight. Make What's cake, make a cake, chocolate cake. Uh, I want the chocolate cake was my favorite. Some fried chicken wings. Yes. You know, um, and, and I see these people in my face right now that I'm thinking about <laughs> that could really cook. And what they do is they they want to please the pastor. Yes. And the pastor's wife says, go ahead, because I don't feel like cooking. Yes. And so we both become big together. Now, did Pastor Kim gain weight, too? She gained a little. She did. She gained a little weight, weight after Micah. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are, but we both were eating, though. Oh. And then Pastor Kim could cook. Pastor Kim could cook. Okay. She can cook. She no, can cook, go. cook, cook. No, she, Pastor Kim could go. Pastor Kim can go, because her mother could cook. So for for the holidays, it was like... 10 things, I mean, you, yeah, so food was all around. Food is all around us. On a typical day, what would you eat? Let's start at breakfast. Uh, you know, bre 
toast, buttered toast, grits, yeah. uh, bacon, yeah. eggs, fried, yes. uh, you know, or you go and get it. Um, lunch, yes. you, you eat McDonald's or Burger King, fast food. Sweet tea was my thing. Sweet tea gets it's sweet tea. Yeah, gets ninety nine cent bur uh, McDonald's sweet tea. That God has put His hands on sweet yeah, tea. Yeah, and then we <laughs> lived in Louisiana, mind yeah. you. When we moved to Louisiana, it would be all that for breakfast, and then we go get some gumbo. Oh, yeah. Go get some gumbo for lunch, yes. and some cornbread and some fried chicken. At I must say, one of the restaurants. If anybody watched me from Morgan City, Louisiana, Rita Mays. Come on, Rita Mays. Miss Rita, you know, uh, red beans and rice. You had rice with everything, everything, which we don't realize. White rice, anything white, breaks down to sugar. So I'm eating this, and then for dinner, you do it all over again all over again and what the thing is members are our biggest issue what i mean by that because they want to see the pastor eat they want to see the pastor <coughs> they want to see the pastor eat they think they they're keeping them healthy and fat and that's what they're doing they're keeping us fat but not healthy tell us about the life of a preacher man in, in 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 what in what sense when when you're pastoring or Pastoring and people in leadership, um, there's um, people will tend to your needs. Mm -hmm. I call they, them enablers. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. trying to be nice, but mm -hmm. they will enable, they will cater to, to your you. detriment. Though. Yeah, they, they will cater to you. They will yes sir you. They will, rarely will they tell you no. Right. It's always yes. Yeah, I've never had anybody tell me no as relates to, uh, can you make me a pie? Can you make me this? Can you make me that? They were enabling me to unhealthy lifestyle. And I say that to, to those that are watching now, you're not helping your pastor, even especially when you know your pastor's not supposed to have it. Pastor, I must sneak you some chitlins for the holiday. I love chitlins. Yeah. Loved them. I, they would make me pots of chitlins. Um, you're not helping your pastor. You're not helping him maintain a healthy lifestyle. You think you are by giving him what we want. Sometimes even your leader, now I'm talking about pastor lifestyle, don't even know what we want. We just think we know what we want. But you're, you're saying, I don't want my pastor here a long time. You're enabling him to an unhealthy lifestyle and you think you're gonna be blessed from that. You're not. You are a man of fashion. Mm -hmm. You're a fashionista. Mm -hmm. You're not new to this. You are true to this. Mm -hmm. So as you begin to transition in size, did that affect at all your fashion? Oh, yeah. Size? You made, you know, you just make the suits bigger, bigger suits, you know. But here's what we do. Um, I always dress nice, even as a child. My mother always had me dress ni dressing nice as I was growing up. You know, I worked with what I had. My grandparents were older, so they didn't spend a lot of money on clothes on us and all that stuff, but I always had to work with. And then when I got my own jobs, then of course, I always dressed nice. But as I got bigger, it made it worse because then I got, I, I became obsessed with tailor-made suits. I, literally, when I, when, I, when I started losing weight, I counted, I had over, I had over 300 suits, tailor-made suits, shirts. Uh, you know, Michael Sahi is the name in the, in the preacher business, throwing your pipe mm -hmm. in the preacher business. And so the bigger I got, I still look good because I was covering the fat. So you tend to wear wide leg pants. You tend to wear uh, wider suits. The lapels get larger. Everything gets larger to accommodate. I was looking at something on YouTube the other day. <clears throat> my daughter's proposal, when, when my son-in-law proposed to her, it was on New Year's Eve. And I'm looking at this, and I had on a orange shirt. Ooh. A orange shirt with orange flowers in it. This is New Year's Eve, I thought I was sharp. Orange flowers throughout it, and a solid orange tie. I call it, and he gonna get me back in the day, the Jamal Bryant look. Um, and I looked at myself, I said, ooh, you look like a clown. 
I look like a clown to me now. When I look back over that, and I know somebody will say, well, you got on a pink sweater now, but no, I look like a clown. And I know they're going to show pictures throughout the program um, of the way I look, but everybody used to tell me, ooh, you sharp. But I was covering the fat. We're looking at a picture right now, and you have on a black suit. I think pink is one of your colors, because you got in this picture right here, you have on a black suit, and you sit in this red chair. When you see this picture, looking at it now versus then, what do you think? Oh, I thought I was clean. I thought I was clean. I promise you, I thought it's in the red chair. I was doing a photo shoot. I, I, nothing's changed about me in that. Uh, I like nice fashion. I do photo shoots on a regular basis. I was doing a photo shoot that was actually at my loft, and I thought I was sharp. I'm gonna tell you, every time I stepped out, I thought I was sharp. I, my, I, I, I dressed more hip hop back then. My, my, my jeans were, were more. Um, expensive now I wear Levi's and Abercrombie I'm not into the expensive stuff because when you're smaller believe it or not you actually can save money more so than when you're bigger when you're bigger you have to you pay more for fabric in this no, I want you to hear what I just said my tailor used to tell me man your suit's gonna cost more because you're bigger right you pay more to be bigger now in this picture right here you got on this black shirt I don't know if that's a coach shirt I don't know if that's C's on there I don't know if that's the material but this is like part of polka dot polka dot oh that's, that's silk polka. polka dot silk polka dot honey silk polka dot let's yeah. not get it twisted yeah silk polka dot with my initials it was everything I wore was every shirt every even some of my ties everything was tailor-made I was big and sharp and, and unhealthy were you were you comfortable and confident oh at that i've size? never had a confidence problem <laughs> excuse me <laughs> confidence has never been one of my issues in life no i've never had a confidence problem i i, I felt good about myself and, and that's what i want to say to somebody no matter no matter what your size you know some people are healthy and big now don't get me wrong S small i met a guy at fish bones at one of our restaurants he says he's a diabetic. He's smaller than me, but he's not eating right. Some people have metabolism to be able to break down that food, but they're still unhealthy. So whatever size you are, be confident in who you are. I was confident. I was confident. Yeah. Larger than charge, fresh to death, as the young people mm -hmm. said. The fly bishop is what they call you. You mm -hmm. didn't just get fly, you've been mm -hmm. fly. Yeah. But there came a point where you felt like, you know what, a shift is coming. Um, I may be large, I may be in charge, but I'm looking for a change in my life. No, actually, I, that, that ain't, that ain't I, it changed for me. What, what will happen, you keep on living my grandfather used to say, yeah, keep on living, son. Keep on eating all that stuff. Keep on living, son. Keep on living. It shifted for me. Your body, keep on living. Your body will shift for you. Your body speaks to you. We just don't want to listen. Your body spoke to you. And when we come back in part two, we're going to talk about what his body said and what happened after that. You've been watching the Greg, Greg Davis Show. Stay tuned.